Stanislas uh, Jourdan. Your movement uh, is taking a lot of initiative about uh, basic income in France, local institutions saying to experiment uh, basic uh, income. Uh, what, are today, what is today your opinion about the possible evolution of this debate? Excellent. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to speak in this house. Um, so, yes, my name is Stanislas Jourdan. Uh, I'm from France, but I live here in Brussels. Just to be clear, as well as a disclaimer, so I currently work for, um, I've been working for a long time on the basic income idea with the French movement. I organized the first European citizen initiative. Uh, but because I thought this was not ambitious enough to campaign for basic income, now I'm, I'm working with a different organization which is called Positive Money Europe. And our ambition is to reform the European Central Bank. So um, just to give you an idea of how much crazy I am and how much uh, utopist. Um, so what do I think about the basic income idea? Well, I think it's already close to mainstream, as we've seen. The fact that Macron just hijacked the world, it, it just means that uh, it, it, it's hype enough for him to surf on the wave of basic income, even though he's making hashes out of it. Um, so I think now is the right time to, to be even more ambitious and to move at the European level, to move this idea at the European level. So the, and this is really what I'm going to talk to you about. My idea is really to define, okay, not just why do we need a basic income at the, the national level. I will briefly uh, sketch out a few arguments, but, but I think that the next discussion is why should we also have it at, at the European level? And of course, how could it work? Huh? I think that's an important question we need to imagine. How can it work? And I think the the justification for European basic income and the way we can implement it is very different. So I think that's, that's really the, the core, I hope, uh, the core value of uh, my presentation. And, um, and basically, I will introduce to you the, the, the proposal that uh, one of the main advocates for basic income, Phil Van Parijs, who is a Belgian philosopher, um, he, he formulated a proposal that is called the Euro Dividend, and I will uh, introduce this concept to you and, and explain a little bit. Uh, so let's get started. So, it's great that uh, Mr. Caracas already spoke, so I don't need to uh, explain you what is basic income. I think that was clear already. Um, except perhaps on, on the idea of the amount, maybe I should just complement uh, the fact that in our movement, in, in the European basic income movement, what we think is the, the right amount uh, is, it should be high enough to, uh, to live in dignity and participate in society. Now, maybe a, a disclosure here or a, a nuance here is that I, I personally think it's not basic income alone that will uh, make sure everyone uh, has, um, has, a, has, a, uh, has enough to live. I think it's basic income plus all the solidarity mechanism, all the benefits, you know, think of housing benefits. And so I think this is a, a perhaps a more nuanced way to put it, that it should be high enough, but not basic income alone. The welfare system as a whole, basic income included, should provide uh, enough support for everyone. So that's just to precise this amount. Next slide, please. Alice, can you please? Okay, so why basic income? So I think a lot of arguments have already been explained, but I think for me those arguments, uh, uh, we can group them in three, three families of argument. The first argument is the bureaucracy argument that has been presented. So the current welfare system is very complex, uh, and it's so complex that in country like my home country in France, we have a non-take-up ratio of 50%. That means 50% of the people who should receive the minimum income, the RSA, uh, they do not uh, make the request to get this benefit. Why? Because they don't know about it, uh, because the formula is too complex, there are too many conditions, and so, and so on. Or even because they don't want, because it's humiliating for them to request, to beg money to the state. So the idea is that we can modernize this system by uh, uh, giving the money to everyone, and therefore you cannot even fraud the system because everyone gets it. So I think that that's an argument of simplification. The second family of argument this argument that was also presented, I think the, 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 notion, the, the, the reference to Thomas Paine is really important. You need to check, check out Thomas Paine uh, because he made the argument that a basic income, the justification for it is not, is, it's not a charity. It's not because you're poor that you sh we should somehow help you. It's because we are all citizens of the same country, of a political community, and it happens that in this political community, we have common resources. We have resources that we should manage collectively, such as land, such as uh, natural resources, think of oil. You know, in Alaska, they, that's the way they do it. They, 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 they distribute the profit of the oil industry 
to all the citizens. So every Alaskan citizen, you have to live there a few winters, so it's not like uh, so easy. Huh? Uh, it's a bit cold there, though I would not recommend to migrate there just to, to get the basic income, it's, it's because it's only $1,000. Uh, per year, so it might be not worth the, the, the flight ticket. But it already exists, you know. Uh, so you consider oil, or even data for that matter, it's a great example. Data is a common resource, oil is a common resource because, you know, it's, it's from the ground. No one deserves it, it just belongs to everyone because it's in our land. Um, and, and therefore, we should all uh, receive a share from it. I think that's really the idea of basic income. Um, and third, and perhaps most relevant for the discussion we have today about post-growth and transition, um, the idea of basic income, of course, is to emancipate people. Uh, you know, by decoupling income from labor, uh, we, we give more bargaining power to people to actually choose what activity they want to do with their lives. Uh, do they really want to continue working for banks or for other kind of bullshit jobs type of things? Or do they want to reduce their working time, uh, allowing a better... Uh, but the distribution of jobs and so on. So I think that's the, the three families of argument. But that's for national, that's sort of the, the general arguments for basic income in general. Now I'm going to, in the next slide, I'm going to present you the argument why it should be European as well. Um, I think the, the main argument right now is that we have a crisis of legitimacy of the European Union, uh, which is connected to the, to the, you know, to the crisis, to the Euroscepticism, all those things, climate change, everything that, that's going on, in the, you know, the power of the lobbies here in Brussels, all those things, all those crises together are questioning le the legitimacy of Europe. In history, there are different ways nations or you know, institutions have, have built their legitimacy. If you think of the German, um, you know, the German as country, they, they have a great nation they, they, because of their culture and you know, they, they build this sense of we are proud of being Germans, for example. You know, it's just one example, but many countries do that, of course, but this is the, the archetype. The second way to, to create legitimacy is the Greek way, you know, the, the demo Athenian democracy is, is by giving, um, um, giving rights, political rights to people. You can vote, but in Athenian democracy you could even participate, uh, you know, people were selected by random to become a, a temporary uh, MP, you know, in a way. So I think this is uh, by giving rights to people. The third way, which I think is really missing in Europe, is by giving people benefits, you know, by giving people an actual uh, tangible uh, advantage of being part of that community. Um, and, you know, in most countries, the, this is what welfare state is about. And, and in Germany, when they created the first pension system, it was also about uniting the country. Uh, so that's, I think what's really missing in Europe is, is a concrete benefit. I think a lot of people have lost the sense that the EU is doing something for them. And basic income would do, I think, just that. Um, so it would anchor a sense of citizenship of this uh, EU. Obviously, one of the main arguments is tackling poverty as well at European level. The, because I'm mentioning this argument now, it's because I think we have to realize that poverty is, is a, you know, a European problem, if not a global problem. So I think it's a bit, um, it's, it's a bit illusion. It's a bit of an illusion to think that we are still going to tackle a, a global problem through the nation states at the, at the national re level. So I think that's an argument for moving this uh, competence at the EU. And third... One of the main arguments that I'm going to make today is also it's, it's about having a basic income at the European level would create a macroeconomic stabilizer. Maybe it's a bit of a jargon here, but basically it would create a more resilient system because we would have transfers across countries. So imagine if we had the basic income in Greece during the crisis, fi financed by the EU. If we had the basic income before the crisis, uh, financed by the EU in Greece, the, the shock, the, the austerity that was required and the effect of the crisis would have been much, much, much uh, smaller. Why? Because there would be this flow of income guaranteed by the EU and not the Greek budget. So you see, you would have a, a certain, you would make sure that the, the, the population in Greece have a certain purchasing power that will not, uh, that will not, um, sorry, uh, reduce because of the crisis. Because you have this system that is at the EU level and not the national level. Just to make an example. Next slide, please. So. How to, how to make it happen? Obviously, you might be wondering already, but how can you do a European basic income? Because we don't have the same living standards in all countries, and you know, we, have, we have actually quite a big disparities between, say, Bulgaria and France and Germany. So how can we uh, have the same basic income uh, in all those different countries? So the answer lays in the Euro dividend proposal that I was uh, mentioning, that has been formulated by, Van, by Philippe Van Paris. And this proposal really is about having a two-tier system. 
uh, a system of basic income with two levels. The first floor on the, on the blue, uh, in the blue bar on the, on the bottom of the chart is the euro dividend, so the European basic income. It's a floor. And on top of that, every uh, member state, every country uh, has its own complementary basic income or other form of minimum income. Huh? It doesn't have to be unconditional. It, it, the key point being, you, the EU should provide the first floor, make sure that no one is under that, that threshold, and then every country can have its own welfare state as they do already today. Uh, although I would agree that the, 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 the point, of course, is to make sure everyone uh, is lifted out of the poverty line. So I think there should be a responsibility for member states to make sure that with their own national, national welfare state, they make sure people, uh, to, they, they should, every country should be obliged to complement the European basic income with other schemes to, um, to uh, lift people out of the poverty line. So that's how basic income at the European level can work, I think, because let's face it, we are not going to harmonize uh, all uh, fiscal and social system across 27 or maybe 28 if Brexit is reversed. Um, uh, um, we are not going to harmonize all those things. And if we manage to do that, it would take you know, one century or, or more. So we have to find another way. And I think this is the way. We can start from, from the bottom and maybe gradually uh, this, basic, this European basic income will grow. Uh, but we are gon not going to tell every member state, look, tomorrow we're going to build a, a super mega welfare state at the EU level. It's not, just not going to fly. It's not going to work. It, 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 it would be a disaster even if we tried. So I think this is a way that we can uh, implement basic income in a, in a different way. Uh, next slide, please. So how to finance it? Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> Probably getting that already in, in time. But, okay, that's fair. Um, I think when, so obviously what we talk about, imagine a, a euro dividend of 200 euros, which is a sort of baseline proposal. I mean, we can imagine other amounts, but I think it's a good average, 200 euros, think of it. Um, it would require 8% of European GDP. So we need to take 8% of uh, GDP, centralize it at the EU level, and then give it back uh, to all citizens. 8%. The current budget of the EU is 1%. So we are talking about... Uh, quite uh, an important uh, leap in, uh, in, 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 uh, fiscal, in a fiscal union direction, you know. So we have to find f taxes that we would centralize at the EU, le EU level, and those taxes have to be, you know, sizable, sustainable, you know. Uh, maybe I won't detail too much here, but... So what are the options? Next slide. Um, there are many options, but I've chosen to present four. I think the first one, the easiest one, is the VAT. Uh, you know, tax and consumption. Why? Because it, it, VAT already serves as, as the tax base, so to, so to speak, of the EU budget. So when we calculate how much uh, Belgium is paying to the EU, we look at the VAT amount. You know, we calculate a bit of other things as well. There are a few other factors. But basically, we take that as a, and, and we say, okay, Belgium has to pay X percent of their uh, budget, of their GDP, which is based on the VAT. So, Basically, it wouldn't be uh, too far to say we're going to, from now on, we're going to take 10%. You know, imagine you have a, we, we're going to just centralize VAT at the EU level, and this will be the EU budget, and this budget will finance basic income. That's the first proposal. I think it's, it's, it's workable, but of course, it's not the most progressive uh, uh, taxation system. Another system would be the European corporation tax. I think there's a group, there's very uh, undeniable case that we need at some point the European tax. Uh, on corporations because of tax evasion issues, uh, and also because multinationals, corporations, uh, have been the main beneficiaries of the single market. So if, if multinationals have, have, have been the, the first beneficiaries of, this, of the single market, why are they still paying taxes to, the, to, to their national member states? I think they should give back to the single market. Um, so that's an argument for, um, for such a tax. And in terms of political feasibility, we are getting there. You know, there's a lot of work being done to harmonize the, the, the corporation tax base. So in a few years, it wouldn't take much to say, well, from now on, there will be a, a special regime where all multinationals who are doing more than X percent of their, of their sales in the single market should move to the, the special regime. The next proposal is a carbon tax. I think it's undeniable that we need a carbon tax, um, especially to move to a post-growth economy and a more sustainable 
and less uh, environmental uh, harmful uh, economy. So we need a carbon tax, and it makes definitely sense to, to do such carbon tax at the EU level, because if we do it at national level, they will, as we have seen again, there will be tax evasion, uh, temptations, and so on. So it has to be European. And the, the last proposal, which is actually connected to what I'm doing now with positive money, is the, 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 the idea of quantitative easing for the people. So very briefly, you know, the European Central Bank has injected 2.5 trillion euros in buying uh, assets on financial markets. So we think, you know, actually instead they could have given us all 1,000 euros and it would have stimulated the economy much more quickly. Um, so now maybe on the downside, so I think this is a great proposal to uh, initiate the basic income, but probably in the long run we cannot just rely on the money creation uh, mechanism. So it could be a way to start it, uh, but, but we will need uh, taxation systems uh, to finance it on the long run anyway. Uh, but, but maybe because it will take ages to create a fiscal union, maybe that's the way to start it. Just, just an idea. Up to discussion. So, yes, thanks. Last slide maybe and then I'll... Um, the, the question, of course, is, you know, we are pulling 8% of GDP at the EU level, so that means some countries are going to pay more than, than others. You know, if you live uh, in the French government, we'll pay a certain amount of taxes to the EU, and then the money will go back to French citizens as well. So the, 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 this graph tries to show how much, as a state, how much do I give, how much do I get back for my country, for my, for my population, right? So what we see, so we've done this chart uh, with a friend to, to try to see, you know, what would be the redistribution impact between countries. So basically how much Greece wins, how much... Germany loses, it, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, we've done two scenarios. One scenario is where you give 200 euros per citizen, you know, Greek citizen, 200, uh, Luxembourgic citizen, 200, and so on. The other scenario, which is in red or orange, um, it's where we adjust this amount by purchasing power parity. So that means it would be more like 230 euros in France and more like 120 in Bulgaria. So we, we do those two things. And what we see is, obviously, if you give it flat, it's a huge redistribution mechanism. Uh, if you, I'm not sure you can read on the chart, but the, 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 the country on the top right, so the main beneficiary would be Bulgaria, and they would have a boost of their GDP by 30%. You know, that's just too much, actually. <laughs> uh, so if we do by purchasing power, then it's probably more realistic because we have 9% uh, for Bulgaria, and it would cost... 1.6% uh, to Germany. The country that would contribute the most would be Luxembourg, unsurprisingly. Uh, and all the, all the Western rich countries would basically contribute to around 1% of the GDP. So we would have quite an important uh, transfer for Eastern Europe to a realm, I mean, we can discuss that, but I think personally it's quite relatively modest as a cost, you know, 1% to make sure that no one lives under 200 euros in, 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 in the whole EU. I think that's I think, I think it's worth discussing about it, basically. Uh, <laughs> we should have a negotiation on that. Uh, and of course, it's not just that Eastern countries are going to benefit from it. I think Germany would be also one of the main beneficiaries, because in Germany now you have a lot of working poor. You have a lot of people doing, uh, you know, the, the mini jobs, the one euro, uh, one euro per hour uh, salaries, and, and this kind of thing. So actually, I, I think 200 euros for, for, for Germans in some situation, it would, be, uh, it would be quite good when you have nothing uh, given by the German welfare state. Um, so worth, worth thinking about it. Um, next slide, very quickly. So I think this, is, this sets the direction. I think there are more modest steps to get there. We could start with children. We could start maybe with young people. We could also start with a sabbatical year type of thing where everyone can decide at some point in their life to receive, let's say, 1,000 euros per month during one or two years by the EU which allows them to start a company, do training. And so we could think of other more targeted schemes that would go along that path. Um, and um, and that, that I think would be maybe, uh, that's what we need to discuss basically uh, now until the next election, right? Um, so thank you very much for, for listening and uh, I look forward to your questions. <laughs>